Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 175. I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving, and we are back with some new content with an awesome guy who's trained at CSP Florida for several off-seasons now. Really had an awesome breakout year this year for the Cubs in their Major League bullpen, and I think he shares a really good story about being a late bloomer, kind of finding his velocity once, getting to the big leagues, learning to be a little bit more durable and really seeing another surge in velocity once he got there and really got adjusted to the workload with some different strategies for both training and recovery. So really good example of a guy who's worked hard to find the right mix and now he's reaping the benefits of it. So we're in for a good one. Overuse injuries have emerged as one of the biggest threats to players at every level of competition. As an example, at the professional level, ulnar collateral ligament injuries at the elbow alone sideline pitchers for an average of over 17 months. That's a ton of lost development and a threat to lengthy careers. Just as concerningly though, for youth players, overuse is the predominant mechanism of injury. So what can be done? Obviously, we need to train athletes to be prepared for all the stresses the game throws at them. However, the other side of the equation, recovery, often doesn't get the attention it deserves. Healthy, recovered arms mean you can stay in the game and give your best on the field, and that's where Mark Pro comes in. Mark Pro is a cutting edge recovery tool that provides all the benefits of active recovery, but without the extra effort, muscular fatigue, or stress to tendons and joints. Players can use Mark Pro as long as needed for exceptional recovery between training sessions or after games. We'll often send Mark Pro units back with athletes to their hotels or even have them use them on team flights. Both easy to use and portable, Mark Pro is a powerful tool that allows recovery anywhere, anytime. Use it while relaxing at home, on the road, or during tournaments. On a personal note, I was originally a naysayer when it came to Mark Pro. However, longtime Cressy Sports Performance athlete Corey Kluber turned me on to it. He adopted Mark Pro into his post-pitching recovery approach, and it was an integral part of him going out and throwing 200 innings year after year. This led me to experiment with it myself and with more of our athletes, and the feedback was consistently outstanding. Now, just a few years later, you'll see it in every major league organization as part of the routines of some of the most accomplished baseball players on the planet. If you're looking for the same results enjoyed by these athletes, visit markpro.com and use the coupon code CRESSY at checkout for an exclusive discount. Again, that's markpro.com, M-A-R-C-P-R-O.com, and use the coupon code CRESSY, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, at checkout for an exclusive discount. Today's guest is a right-handed pitcher who was born and raised in California. He attended Skyline College for two years, followed by two years at Oklahoma Baptist University. In his senior year at OBU, he posted a 1.07 ERA and 132 strikeouts and 21 walks in 100 innings. The Cleveland Indians drafted him in the fifth round of the 2014 MLB draft. They added him to their 40-man roster after the 2017 season, and he was then traded to the Toronto Blue Jays at the end of the 2018 season. After starting the 2020 season at the alternate site during the pandemic, he was called to the big leagues on August 20th. He spent portions of the 21 and 22 seasons in the big leagues of the Blue Jays and was then claimed off waivers by the Chicago Cubs at the end of the 22 season. In 2023, he made 69 appearances out of the Cubs bullpen, striking out 98 with 35 walks in 72 innings pitched with a 3.38 ERA. Please welcome to the show, Julian Merriweather. Julian, what's up? Thanks for joining the show. Hey, how you doing, eh? It's a this pleasure, is, man. Honor to be on it. I'm psyched, man. This is gonna be fun. You always are. You're always a life of the gym when I see you in the morning. So we get to to bring it to a larger audience tonight. Yeah, I, I'm a morning person, so we'll chalk it up to that. Yeah. All right, we'll do we'll do our best to stay awake. We're recording at eight o'clock, so this <laughs> yeah. is this is big time for both of us. Um, all right, man. So so talk to me about your early sports career. I think a lot of people obviously know as you know, big league pitcher Julian Merriweather. But what was uh, elementary, middle, and and high school Julian like? I mean, through the years, I mean, I'm a kid around the neighborhood, just playing all the sports, right? Basketball, just pick up football games, baseball, wiffle ball, all that fun stuff. Um, I mean, in high school, it came down to, you know, freshman B basketball (laughs) was my first official sport in high school. You know, I was a little role player. Uh, I mean, at that time, I'm five, six, maybe five, seven on a good day. Wow. They had this one play. They'd run up for me gate. I still remember I'd, I'd run the baseline right under the hoop. I'd shoot up the the middle of the key through a double screen. You know, they give me the ball right in the, the shooter's pocket, wherever they call it. And I'd, I'd let it rip. And, you know, I obviously missed a lot of them. So that's why I'm on the FMD. <laughs> that's, that's why we're playing baseball today, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't know if my knees would have held up great on the hardwood, but yeah. Well, but I'm, you went to J. Sarah, which is not a slouch athletic school. Who, who are some of the more noteworthy alums besides Julian Merriweather? 
I mean, I'm definitely on the list uh, of pro guys, but I mean, there's a few guys that kind of crowd that list. Tom Brady, uh, Barry Bonds. Never heard there's of him. For some older, <laughs> older guys with the football pedigree, but I mean, the history in that school is, is crazy. Yeah. It was like the main reason I wanted to go to that school. They're mm-hmm. really great sport or like school. And um, yeah, they obviously knew how to create some one of some of the best competitors to ever play in their sports. So it's really, really cool to go there. Was baseball up there as well? Obviously, you mentioned some some big time football players, but did the baseball program hold a candle to that too? Yeah, I, th- I think baseball is probably the one of the biggest sports there as far as you know consistently winning uh, and and producing a lot of pro guys and and guys that have gone and had pretty pretty good careers. Interesting. Describe like the scouting report on you as like a, a freshman through senior. How did how did it evolve over the course of your time there? I mean, I, I was definitely a late bloomer. Like I said, mm-hmm. you know, freshman year I was pushing five seven. Uh, kind of slowly grew up till junior year, kind of hit my my growth spurt. And that's kind of when things started changing, you know, mechanically and physically. Um, I would definitely still tell myself to eat a little bit more. Uh, it's kind of a, just a twig of a guy back then. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that, that process happened and I learned a lot just kind of how to, how to adapt. And, and you know, it was, it was all something that um, down the road I look back on and like there's so much foundation there from, from a fundamental standpoint that I worked on because I wasn't the, the elite athlete really back then. I, I was the guy who had to focus on control, command, knowing myself. And, and I think that was, that was something I learned early on that, that helped me a lot. One of the things I, I think a lot of people know you for now, we were, we were actually talking about it in the gym the other day is like, you're, you're one of the few guys in baseball. I think you throw four pitches out of the pen, right? You know, you've always been able to spin it at a pretty high level. You got a really good change up. Did some of that come from, you know, being a late bloomer, having to like locate and, and spin and do different things just because maybe the velocity wasn't there or was there always kind of the quick arm that there is today? No, I mean, by my senior year in high school, I'm I'm pushing maybe 85 on a on a good day with the fastball. I was much more of an off speed, you know, change speeds, locate um, kind of guy. And uh, again, I think that was a huge part of why I'm successful now. Is like you have to maybe not depend on the stuff all the time to get outs. And like at the end of the day, I was still able to get outs. It wasn't the kind of stuff that I think D1 t- uh, schools were looking for at the time, but um, it, it was just something that had to develop over time. So you, you were obviously a, a little bit undersized as an athlete. Did, did multi-sport stuff carry through high school or was it just too hard at that like, competitive school to, to actually be able to play multiple sports in high school? It was, it was so competitive there that it was probably best to focus on one. Um, I will say there was a two week period. I mean, jumping ahead a little bit into Juco where I thought I could still be a shortstop mm-hmm. and being a two way player. I mean, looking at guys like Otani now, it's like you're playing two sports. You're, yeah. you're not playing the same sport. So in a way that that felt like I was playing two sports and and man, well, was I not out cut out for that whatsoever? <laughs> I learned really quickly that, you know, I'm going to stick to one thing and then try to try to see where it goes. When you um when you left high school, I mean, obviously you're talking 85, you weren't a draft prospect and, and you went to junior college. And, and I honestly, I love that discussion just because so many kids get really fixated on this division one dream. And we see a lot of kids that that go to schools that maybe are reach or they go to a school that they're not going to play at until they're junior. And, and you were a guy who went to junior college um, and obviously it worked out well. You're, you're playing in the big leagues. What was it that, that junior college afforded you? Um, you know, it was, it was one year there and then you went to another school afterwards, which we can talk about, but w- was that a hard like decision to come to, or was it just that you were very realistic about what you needed to do? It, it was a yeah, very realistic approach, you know, obviously not having any offers, had a few, you know, walk on offers and we all kind of know those can be pretty, you know, uh, flimsy when it, when you actually get there, who knows if you're going to get any opportunity at all. And that, that was the main thing that I was looking for was, was opportunity. Um, I, I wanted to go to a place where I could develop, work on my skill set, and, uh, and, you know, give myself the best chance to at least showcase what I can do. And it just bought me some extra time to, you know, it obviously didn't work out in Juco really at that time. I think, uh, my sophomore year Juco, I, I was like, oh, and seven with a six ERA or something. <laughs> So I, I was a long way from knowing what I was doing, even though I thought I knew what I was doing. And uh, it really just came down to chasing opportunity and uh, not being tied with the egos behind D1s and and whatever prestigious uh, colleges you were trying to get into. Uh, it just came down to the decision, like, do I want to go to school just to go to school or do I want to actually go to a JUCO where I know I can still play baseball and, and, uh, and try to follow that dream. So it actually came pretty close to me almost not playing baseball after high school, just because, you know, I figured, oh, this might not be it for me. And uh, mm-hmm. still kind of having that dream, like everyone has that dream, they don't want to just give up on it. So mm-hmm. following that dream, I mean, it just kind of 
luckily turned out for me. How did it change over the course of the four years? Because it looks like you had, you know, some decent initial set success when you got to junior college. As you mentioned, the second year, actually, I pulled it up when you said that it was 0 and 8 and uh, uh, 63 innings pitched and uh, 6.57 ERA. There was some tough luck in there if you look at the FIP and stuff, but um, you didn't pitch a whole lot your first year when you went to um, to Oklahoma Baptist, but then things clicked. So your last year at Oklahoma Baptist was 100 innings pitched, 132 strikeouts, 21 walks, and you obviously became a fifth rounder. Like what was the development over the, the course of the four years? Like how did it, was it was it physicality? Was it just velo? Was it just understanding how to compete against different hitters? What what changed so much during those four years? I mean, first off, I would have loved to have known that FIP even existed back then. <laughs> you made you feel a lot better. Hey, you're doing okay, buddy. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't around back then, yeah. so I was just stuck with that six year array. Uh, I can't believe they have FIP on junior college games from 2012. That's pretty pretty know, right? encouraging, right? <laughs> but no, that that development happened. Uh, Really, I, I would say the the main uh, d- uh, turning point for me was my my junior summer. So after my first year at Oklahoma Baptist, I had a decent year. Uh, the velocity still wasn't anything to really look at. It was still 85, 88, maybe on a good day. Um, and I, I found this this weighted ball program, the Texas Baseball Ranch, uh, which you know was really big back in the day, and uh, it opened up my eyes to a whole different way of mechanics and ways to prepare your arm and and just um, basically unlock a lot of hidden potential. I, I kind of felt like I always had, I always had this athleticism. I just wasn't able to really transfer it to the mound and, uh, years of coaching of, Hey, just kind of tall and fall and, and yeah. locate and do this and that it, it wasn't getting the the most out of me. I don't think so just kind of ha- having that little spark where I go to this, this baseball ranch and it's a little three day camp and I'm in there doing a pull down, and, and they, they clocked me at a hundred on a, on a, basically a, a crow hop. Mm-hmm. And I'm a guy who's never hit 90 in my life. So I see a hundred on a radar gun and I'm like, well, what the heck's you know going on here? Obviously there's, there's some, there's something in there that I, that I haven't untapped. And uh, it was really, it was really like a huge eye opening experience, but then the road from there was not really that, that easy. It's not like I jumped on the mountain. I was 95. All of a sudden it was, that first spring game in my senior year, I was, I hit 89. Then, then the next spring game, I hit 91 and then 92. And then it just slowly kind of built up. The more I kind of stuck with the program, uh, the more I kind of just, you know, was experimenting with myself as well. Um, one of the main things I loved about OBU uh, was that they were very kind of hands off. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the pitching was kind of letting you do what you, you do. You know, they brought me over and they, after my first year, they kind of, believed in me and it was very just hey do your thing and I think that gave me a lot of room to explore uh figure out who I was and and find success at the end of the day I I needed to put up some numbers and kind of back up what I what I was doing at that point I mean it's awesome it obviously paid out for you you know you always hear about you know I always worry about guys being almost like an injury risk when the velocity spikes that fast you know I mean you almost want it to just be like this gradual linear progression where guys you know, go to college at 88 and they're 96, their senior year. And it's just like, oh, it's two miles per hour a year. Everything works out well. Did you go through like significant soreness, anything like that as you, as you saw that spike? I mean, that's a big deal to almost like PR every week out over a, you know, a one-year period. Was that, was that a hard thing to adjust to, adjust to workload wise? I'm thinking back, I mean, being 21, man, I I think that takes care of a lot of the (laughs) sore. Yeah. Uh, It was more like, all right, I want to throw more. I I, like, I'm throwing this higher velocity. I want to throw it more. I want to train it. And, you know, it wasn't, you didn't have the guys kind of pulling you back saying, Hey, maybe we should, you know, take this slow. It was all just a learning experience for me. So yeah, there's definitely days where you're getting pretty sore, but you know, college is also nice. You're throwing once a week. Uh, the recovery isn't nearly as yeah. really important as it is the higher levels where you're expected, at least in my role now, to be ready, you know, 50% of the time, 70% yeah. of the time as a reliever. Um, yeah, so that was that was something I, I didn't really have to deal with them. But, I mean, we'll get into it. Like, obviously, getting into pro ball and, and maturing, yeah. that, that becomes a huge part of your routine and, and how you're going to kind of go day to day. You, you kind of hinted at it, but the seven day rotation, you can, you can get away with murder, right? Like there's lots oh, yeah. of, there's lots of time. Everybody feels a hundred percent. You talk to anybody that goes to a five day rotation and pro ball and it, it hits you in the oh. face, right? It's, it's tough to bounce back. And you came to pro ball after you're drafted and you were starter for a little bit. Um, Tommy John got you there not long after, and, and you came back as a reliever. What was the rationale for the switch? Was that something? Cause you're still a guy that, that threw a lot of different pitches and, and, and located them well and had nasty stuff. 
was that adjustment you were in favor of? Was it something you fought or you know, how did it all go down? That, that, I mean, I, obviously, I think most guys in the big leagues, whether you're a reliever or starter, I, I think most guys at some point were started as a starter. And yeah. it comes down to just circumstances. And, I mean, for me, it just came down to, hey, we got to keep this guy in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. With the Blue Jays, I, I was traded for Josh Donaldson. So the expectations were pretty high. And, I mean, as I said, it was either MVP or bust for me. Mm -hmm. And it was obviously more of a bust. But, uh, you know, like going through that process as a starter and and really the rehab start, uh, process with, with Tommy John, you learn a lot about your body. Um, I was someone who really dove into rehab, really hardcore, you know, jumping on all the modalities, doing all the exercises, really getting my body in the, the highest peak form. Mm -hmm. And I think what I didn't realize at that time when you're so ingrained to being in rehab is that you don't have the same workload from a baseball standpoint. Yeah. Like the, the, the workload in the gym is high, but you're, you're, they're kind of tailoring you down with the baseball and slowly building you up. And I think just over time, I kind of got so ingrained with the rehab mentality of work and do this exercise and, and, and keep recovering with this. And it, I was kind of raising both levels of workout in the gym, as well as baseball intensity. And I think that's kind of was kind of a double edged sword for me where I was I was kind of not used to what it took to actually maintain a high baseball workload, not just, you know, staying strong in the gym, keeping your elbows strong, per se. Um, so that was something I learned. Definitely. How long did it take to kind of adjust to that? Right. Because you're you're obviously in like rehab mode, rehab mode, rehab mode, where it's just like do this, recover, do this, recover. And then eventually you get thrown back into the circumstances of baseball where it's like, oh, you got to throw back to back. Good luck with your old protocol. We're going to we're going to put you on a nine hour bus ride and see how you figure it out. Um, you know, what were some of the biggest things that maybe you learned through that, that Tommy John process? Yeah, obviously learning how to balance, like looking back, it's more of like, I can look back and see, Hey, I, I was attacking my rehab, uh, much. I was attacking like my, my healthy baseball workload. Like I was still in rehab. Like mm -hmm. I was crushing BFRs. I was still crushing my lifts mm -hmm. and it felt like that was what I needed to do to stay healthy. Cause obviously yeah. all the rehab, they're trying to keep you as healthy as possible, feeling yeah. as good as possible. There's no schedule. So I, I just didn't realize that when you actually have to shorten up the the recovery times, I wasn't, and I don't think anyone really could really bounce back when you're, when you're throwing so much at your body. Um, mm -hmm. During season, baseball comes first. Like the weightlifting takes a, takes the back seat. Off season, obviously weightlifting takes, you know, the, you know, takes the wheel and that's really going to drive it. But, you know, that was, that was a huge thing I learned just knowing what my body was capable of. And then, I mean, obviously the whole difference from being a starter and a reliever, I mean, yeah. your, your intensities are totally different. Your warm-up routines are different. You don't really have that routine as you have as a starter. Um, so it, it's much more of a, as a reliever, it was, it was really learning how to survive each day. And then that, in, in a way that kind of helps you down the line, realizing what your body can handle. Looking back, I almost kind of see why there was, it's obviously always easy to say this in hindsight, but why there were some struggles, right? You have the, you have the normal struggle of like college to pros, like the competition is, is more intensive. The travel is more extensive, um, all that side of things. And then, you know, a lot of guys get shifted from starting to relieving during that time period. And then, Hey, here's a new elbow, go, go figure it out. Good luck. And, and you know, we're not going to tell you when you're going to pitch, you know, those, yeah. there's just so many variables that come into play. And I don't think people realize that, you know, like pro ball is, it's a very uncontrolled circumstance, um, you know, like off season rehab mode, college mode, all that stuff is a very, very controlled dynamic. You have people telling you when to go to study hall and you, all the travel arrangements are very meticulously manicured yep. pro ball. It's, it's a long season. There's a lot of places where things can go wrong. Totally. totally. Um, talk to me about what are, what are lessons that you would share to others who, who are maybe embarking on this Tommy John process? Obviously, elbow injuries are, are sky high. It's big, actually a big conversation point in the news today um, with pitch clock stuff and all that as well. What, what are some of the lessons that you would share with, you know, the 17-year-old the kid that, that's going through this? Um, I mean, my biggest takeaway was was patience. Uh, mm -hmm. Like The mental game in rehab, I, I can argue, is probably harder to deal with than being healthy and going through a full major league season like I did this year is like the grinds that you go through mentally kind of you have to give your brain something to mm -hmm. uh to do you know I'm a guy who's kind of a cerebral guy so if, if I don't have that kind of challenge I'm I kind of lose a little the sense yeah. of that and say so I mean I think that prepared me for for being in the big leagues and realizing that you know mentally I, I've worked on a lot of those things uh getting to certain books that I was really interested in about stoicism and, and dealing with failure and how, how you bounce back. And, uh, a lot, a lot of good lessons I learned kind of through that process where I could, you have the time when you're in rehab and, 
it's a lot better than going back home after your three hour day and then sitting on the couch. You know, there's stuff that I, ha I had to do just to keep my brain busy. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the pitch mix. Like it's, it's adjusted over the years. Um, it's, it's obviously it's, it's elite. There's a lot of good things happening there, but I know you didn't just roll out of bed and start throwing these when you were 15. How has it evolved since you were in high school? It's, it's been crazy, man. Cause I mean, I, I was really just a fastball changeup guy in college with, with a loopy curveball that kind of, it got by, but I was just here, here's 95 and here's an 80 mile an hour changeup. You can figure it out. And that was, that worked for me for, for a long time. Uh, obviously when you get the pro ball, like having a nasty breaking ball is such a, such a differentiator. Um, it actually took me a long time to develop my slider. Now um, I would say I started really getting my slider down in 2020, 2020, 2021, it became a pitch that, Oh, this is, this is going to play. And uh, I was able to get through those years kind of with the fastball slider as being my focus, the changeup kind of took a back seat. Um, and then, you know, now I have, I've added a, a sweeper as well. It's, uh, I wouldn't say I use it a bunch, but it's just a great, option to have if I'm facing a righty who's just going to foul off foul off foul off and I can throw a fourth pitch in there it's mm -hmm. it's something that you know it's as a reliever I'm not gonna lie it's not it's not easy having four pitches because sometimes mm -hmm. you feel like hey like how can I sequence this guy perfectly like I'm in a video game yeah and we all know when you're out there this, it's a far very yeah. far stretch from a video game there's so many yeah. things going on in your head where you just need something that's tried and true and tested and mm -hmm. it came down to confidence in my pitches so, I mean, seeing the slider play up, seeing the, the sweeper play up in spring training this year, it was, was, was a good sign for me. And always knowing that my fastball changeup was like my bread and butter. So it's really was something that, you know, uh, analytically they might not love, but I always had confidence in my changeup and it, it's a pitch that's kind of differentiated me. I think it's a kind of an equalizer for me. I mean, it showed obviously 2023 was a, was a big breakout year. I think the stuff was always electric. But what was really interesting is age 31, you're 32 now, so happy to be related birthday, but um, you had your highest average and peak ball, uh, fastball velocities of your career, and you made a career high 69 appearances out of the bullpen for the Cubs this year. So I'm always fascinated, you know, like it seems like you had two like surges in your career, right? You had the surge when you initially kind of captured some of that velocity during summer ball back in, in your college days, and then you did it this year with more velocity, but then you went out and you, you, you consistently performed. What were the adjustments that you think helped fuel, you know, this, not just the performance, but the durability while doing it? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was something I've been trying to really lock in on the last basically three, four off seasons really is the durability. Right. Mm -hmm. And kind of similar to my, my career in high school up to college, like it was all about trying things. Hey, it didn't work. All right, let's try something new. Like it didn't work. Try something new. I mean, just to walk you through 2020, I got, that was a shortened season, obviously, but I started in the, whatever spring train, spring train 2.0, whatever they call it. Outside, right? Outside. Yeah. Back in the bubble. Um, yeah. I, I had an oblique step back there that kind of kept me from being hundred percent to start the season. Uh, 2021 came back with a good start oblique again, 2021, more of a major one that kind of, kind of took me out almost for the whole year with some setbacks. And then guess what? 2022 came back, another oblique, a little bit more minor, but it just kept rearing its head. And uh, we were always focused on the oblique. Like, hey, why is the oblique this? Why is the oblique that? And I mean, working with all the pitching guys down there, uh, we have a Cressy, working with your PT, a Schoenberg. Uh, we, we were finally able to diagnose, hey, maybe this is more of a ground up problem. Like mm -hmm. we can always look at the oblique, but there's some things that are happening in my delivery specifically like shin angle or, yeah. or dorsiflexion, whatever you want to call it, uh, in my load leg where I was really getting knee over toe pretty aggressively. And it led to kind of a slight kind of crossfire, yeah. which then I had to compensate with posture to kind of get mm -hmm. back online to get that, get that glove side uh, down. So finally just trying things over and over again, uh, this last off season or not this one, but the previous one, it was just focusing on getting my heel connected to the mound, working from the ground, putting my hip in a good position. And it like, everything kind of worked off that, like my stride cleaned up. My posture wasn't nearly as, you know, inconsistent as it was. And it, it just kind of seemed like it didn't click overnight, but it was something that I could feel through the off season. Like, Oh, you know, things are kind of happening smoother. Like my delivery, I, I don't need as much effort in certain parts of my delivery as I thought. I used to be kind of a very drop and drive guy, 
jump, not quite jump off the mound, but definitely try to use that explosiveness. And now I, I've kind of found it where I just need to keep my body in good positions. Yeah. And the timing of it is so much more important than I think overusing your athleticism, especially guys that have that kind of extra um, fast twitch kind of, yeah. you know, so it's like, it's good to have, but it, if you don't harness it, you can go off the rails pretty quick. And I was just someone yeah. that was not very consistent with my delivery and really locking in my, my ground forces was by mm -hmm. far like the biggest thing that kind of like lined everything up, I think. Yeah, you made you made an awesome point. I'm asking you just like described a Thea meeting as we like our, our pitching guys are going to love listening to this is that you talked about that vertical shin. It doesn't have to be completely vertical, but it is a sign of the direction, right? So if you're really knee over toe and as a right hand pitcher drifting heavily towards third base, like, yeah, you can you can get away with it if you're an elite rotator, like you can go and you can throw a ball into a lefty, but what do you have to do compensatorily to get there, right? For you, it was tons and tons of thoracic rotation to get to that point. And you, you kind of just steer the ship a little bit on more online and, and all of a sudden you can still leverage all of that elite rotation. It's just done in a tighter window. I think we've seen a real like yeah. generation of kids that like sell out for hip shoulder separation. And I can't tell you how many times we see these guys who have, you know, this, this insane hip shoulder separation, but the sequencing is, is absolutely horrific. They're, they're chasing motion that they, they have, but they'd have no idea how to control. So um, nothing matters until you get that front foot down, huh? Oh, exactly. That's like the old Nolan Ryan, nothing yeah. happens if your front foot gets down. And um, yeah, I, I would say the one thing I looked at really from my 2022 season, I went back and looked at every pitch. You know, we have all these great video tools yeah. now where you can go back and look at all your outings. And I was just looking for, hey, what what's, is there a theme here? Like what, what was part of my struggles here in 2022? And I consistently found myself getting the two strike counts pretty, pretty well, like strike thrower for the most part, getting the two strike counts but not able to finish guys. And I was, mm -hmm. and I was watching my pitches. I was, I was hanging sliders. I was trying to do too much. I was, I was missing fastballs up arm side, trying to do too much. I'm like, why can't I just put guys away? And it was really, I just, my, my body wasn't really in the right position to do that. Mm -hmm. And that was something I really was able to think about, huh? What, why is, why is this happening? And that, that was a huge factor in, in changing my mechanics and really looking at things a little bit more fine. Cause I mean, if you look at my delivery from, 2022 to 2023 you you might think oh he looks pretty pretty much similar the pretty same guy right but it's just the the devil's in the details and like yeah. it's those small things that the tweaks that kind of help my body just work the way it should i mean i don't think the mechanics i use are, are the best for everyone like there's guys who throw from all different sh angles and and sides of the mound and all this kind of stuff and and that's just what i found worked for me you know like mm -hmm. i said like it's it's you got to keep trying stuff until it works and that was kind of yeah. always kept me going well, I think there's, there's positions and then there's pressures, right? Like, you know, you can, and, and this is why I've never really been a big fan of like looking at still frame photos of the delivery. Like they can be very deceiving because, you know, to your point, it doesn't talk about whether you're like actually working into the ground, whether there's like a, an actual back hip load with some counter rotation, or if it's just kind of just collapsing into your, to your knee and drifting, you know, kind of towards third base. I think that's a, a really good point. So I always understand pressures versus positions. Um, when we talk about injuries, I always, relate things like there's there's load and then there's capacity and an injury happens when the load is excessive relative to a, a tissue's tolerance for it um and, and certainly by making those mechanical adjustments you, you you reduce the load right like you just don't beat yourself up nearly as much when you're staying in a tighter window and rotating efficiently versus like hanging out on joint end ranges but i'm curious you know even beyond like that 69 appearances in a big league bullpen. And that's just the ones that we know about, right? There's, you know, there's also all the false alarms where you get hot and then go sit yep. down or, you know, you, you, you're pitching a rain delay and the game doesn't count or whatever it is. Like, what are some other key strategies that you employed to stay, you know, fresh throughout the year? And, and do you have any advice you'd give to relief pitchers who are getting up to higher levels and, you know, they've, hey, they've been throwing every third day in the minor leagues and it's a, it's a perfectly structured schedule that they have no idea what's ahead. I think that was part of it for me. It, it was definitely growing pains in the bullpen. Um, you, you go from being a starter where you're going to conserve your bullets and just try to try to get the volume out. And then once I was a reliever, it's like, oh, I can just empty the tank in one inning. Mm -hmm. And that mentality hurt me a little bit because mm -hmm. when I would go back and reach back for extra, I was I was putting myself in bad positions. Um, but every time I thought, all right, this right, I'm going to give him my best fastball. By, by 2022, I was I was almost like, I don't, I'm not sure if my body can handle this stuff. I know mm -hmm. I, I had the, the extra intensities in there, but it's something was always in the back of my mind. Like, I'm not sure I can really let this rip. Mm -hmm. And 
coming to 2023 and, and all those mechanical adjustments by, I would say by about midway through the year, it really started clicking pretty well with the velocity kind of starting to go up. It was actually like, I, I wasn't trying to throw as hard and, and I didn't have to try to dig for that extra. I was throwing more at my 85 to 90% competitive, not always trying to, Oh, let's, let's throw this ego heater right here and, and look at the scoreboard. Um, it was just a lot more smooth, uh, kind of like a golf swing, right? I, I think baseball is a lot more smooth than it is kind of quick, jumpy, like quick, uh, kind of, uh, flexed up kind of positions, right? It's, it's more about smooth and, and being elastic and, and timing everything up. So having everything that I worked on and then also realizing, Hey, if you just kind of let momentum do its job, if you let gravity do its job and, and let everything work, you actually get a lot of force down the mountain. I mean, it's a slope. You got, you got to use the slope. I love that. What about the actual like overall workload outside of, you know, the games, like how much did you have to adjust your pregame throwing? Like, are you a guy that likes to really like do much at four o'clock? Does it just play catch? What's your usual approach there? Uh, so a, a cool adjustment, I guess I could say this year was with the Cubs. I mean, you're playing a lot of day games. Uh, yeah. So it's a lot of night to day. The, that's the kind of stuff you don't really see, right? The, yeah. the recovery time is just not there. So there's, there's days where I'm just not throwing before the games. Mm -hmm. And especially with day games, if I threw the day before, I would, I would, Hey, I'm going to take this off and, and wait to see if my name's called later. And yeah. found that that actually gave me a lot of extra juice in the games, especially for those day games. And I, it's definitely something I'm going to keep doing in the future, whether I'm in day games or not, but it's listen to your body and knowing like, yeah, you only have so many bullets and mm -hmm. uh, it comes down to how much you want to work on the flat ground versus how much you want to work on a mound. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a guy who loves stone off the mound. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm not touching the mounds, in a game, I don't go more than two days without touching it, at least in flat ground. So it's at least every other day on flat ground, uh, on days I'm not throwing, I'm going to get off the slope for 10 to 15. Um, and all that really is, is I'm taking 10 to 15 pit throws that I'm not doing on flat ground and throwing them on the mound. And that kind of keeps the volume in check. Mm -hmm. Obviously off the mound, you got to keep your intensity in check yeah. too. I mean, you're, you're there to pitch in the game, but it, yeah. I, I thought that was that was huge for me is throwing off the mound keeps me really locked in. And that's just something that's really hard for me to keep all my pitches sharp and, and seeing them, them come out the way you want to see it. Sometimes I would throw three pitches, uh, yeah. fastball. Okay. That's a good fastball slider. Okay. That's a, that's a good slider change up. Perfect. All right. We're done. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's about making sure that I'm locked in. I don't want to go three days without pitching yeah. and I have just a mound in three days. Like that's, that's something that uh, was a, a learning experience where I'm not overdoing it, but just staying right on that brink of, being ready and, and overdoing it, I, I think was something to, I had, I had to wrestle with, but it, yeah. I learned a lot about it. I think the self-restraint piece is big too. Like you obviously know like how much to do, what the intensity should be. I think the problem with a lot of guys when they get on the mound is like, they see all the tech, they see all the coaches, they see the catcher, oh, yeah. you know, it just, the nature of getting on the mound creates a more competitive environment. Usually there's fans like right around there. If you're, you're doing it in the pregame setup versus like when you're on the field, like you're out there with 20 other guys, they're all playing catch, not paying attention. So flat ground to, to bullpen, you know, obviously jumps intensity for some guys, but if you have the awareness of like, I'm not going to let it eat over 85 or something like that. You could still get a lot of quality work in. Yeah. And I, I, that's a great tool. Like having the tech there is actually good for that. To, mm -hmm. it's, it's more for me to be, Hey, you're not going to be throwing 95. Yeah. Every that doesn't yeah. make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I honestly keep a governor on it and, and mm -hmm. just feel the body more than, than actually have to see the tech. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it's more working on pitch shapes, making, making sure stuff spinning kind of the way you want. Mm -hmm. And, and it lines up with how you feel. What about the lifting side of things? I mean, you made a really good point about, you know, kind of the goal is to keep the goal as the goal. Everything you do in the weight room has to support playing baseball for a living. Did you make any adjustments in season to how much you were doing, particularly when the workload got really high? I mean, I'm a guy who likes the routine. I mean, being a former starter, I, st yeah. I still have that routine kind of mindset ingrained in me. So yeah. something that I've, I've always done is I lift on the second game of every, every series. So yeah. it, basically comes down to two two lifts maybe three a week and it kind of goes back and forth between a what they call like a neural neural lift which is kind of just more of like a body priming lift just hey mm -hmm. get the body moving maybe i do it before throwing that day do it fast yeah exactly just like kind of do a few few sets of everything just to run the body through something and then you have your days where it's usually a post game lift would be the heavier ones where maybe if i throw that day i would pick a pick a heavier lift just to kind of try to get all my recovery into the same same night but mm -hmm. that was uh that was kind of my my in season uh, lifting program. I mean, obviously, off season I'm with you guys. You're killing me right now, dude. <laughs> so killing me, man. I, I'm surprised I'm 
right now. <laughs> so I'm doing this sitting down. Um, talked about like uh, other recovery modalities. What do you like? Are you, you know, any kind of like BFR guys? Are you hot, cold, a manual therapy? What do you like to use between outings? All of the above. Uh, yeah. I mean, the modalities now you get in the big leagues is just amazing. Uh, we have we have a sauna. We have cold plunges. We have hyperbaric chambers. The BFRs, obviously, all the soft tissue you need. Um, and for me, it was it was really locking in on all right. What what are the things that I like the most? So for me, it was like doing a really intense sauna, probably once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, not not every day I don't like doing it every day I like getting a real intense kind of reaction from it so I'll be in there from anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half Jeez. With, with some breaks a few Dis breaks disclaimer it's, it's break breaks at home. <laughs> yeah yeah don't do this all and don't listen yeah. to what I'm doing for yeah. sure uh, but yeah. that was something I like throwing there the cold yeah. plunge is something I hate doing which is why yeah. I kind of have I like doing it at the same yeah. time so that's something I, I would I'll try to get around like 10 minutes a week of, mm -hmm. of cold plunge so I'll just sit there try to have a conversation with someone probably in the hot tub, someone mm -hmm. to talk me through it. And then, uh, yeah, I jump out. And, and that was my thing. I don't jump in the hot tub after it. Mm -hmm. I got to, I got to warm up my body after the cold tub, I think on my own kind of gets, it, it's, it's a way of getting the real benefit I think from it instead of kind of, Oh, I can jump in a hot shower after this, or I can jump mm -hmm. in the hot tub and kind of warm up again. I, I feel like that's kind of cheating, at least for me. Right. You got to embrace uh, the suck. <laughs> it's a little bit of that and just yeah. kind of i think dude, that's such a mental mental mm -hmm. game too because you realize that your body's just ringing up these these fire alarms inside and you realize oh it's just your brain telling you to do things when really you're you're in control of it and like that's kind of what one thing i took from that is when you're out there pitching you can't be given into these these like little feelings you might have like oh this feels a little sore today this this doesn't feel right or this is mm -hmm. like you know a little bit off today it's it's all about focusing on on getting through the moment and like mm -hmm. each breath in a cold tub you're just trying to get through each moment and that's kind of what it is out there when you're pitching too it's an interesting metaphor i like that what's next for you um how do you how do you continue to refine and improve as you as you attack this career oh uh, i mean there's there's always when you have four pitches you can always be working on something uh yeah. I think me mechanically i i found a delivery that i think is is going to work for me uh it's all about making making the small, small adjustments to my pitch repertoire. Uh, like I said, the changeup was a, it's a pitch near and dear to my heart. You know, it kind of was always my favorite pitch growing up. I love Trevor Hoffman as a kid. He was my favorite, favorite pitcher. Uh, I got to meet him actually once uh, on at his beach house, luckily enough. And that was a funny little story, but I mean, that's always been a cool uh, pitch to have. And, and th this last year, I kind of fell in love with the slider. I would say a little bit more. And I, I totally want to, use that pitch more in the future and, and can continue to develop it. Cause I think baseball is always going in different directions. You know, yeah. you've seen it over the years, you know, it's like, all right, can we get a guy with a four seam vertical with, uh, with an absolute hammer curveball? And then it became the sweeper and then it became the, you know, the cutter or the gyro. It's like, if you can kind of just keep all your, all your weapons kind of ready, it kind of mm -hmm. prepares me for any battle out there. So whatever the hitters are adjusting to, I can at least, Oh, well, I'm going to make sure you got to think of this pitch too. It's not, I'm not a, a one trick pony kind of out there. Right on. Um, all right. We always wrap up with a lightning round. I feel like you're going to be, you're going to be great with your responses. You're, oh. you're, you're, you're a witty guy. You're very quick to, to, me. to come through. Um, who do you like to watch? What pitchers? Oh man. Uh, so coming from the, from the blue Jays, there's some, some guys out there with just some tremendous crazy stuff. Uh, Jordan Romano closer for mm -hmm. them. Similar kind of pitch mix, uh, which is the fastball slider. Uh, he's just an absolute dog out there. Competitor, mm -hmm. uh, Nate Pearson, guy with just mm -hmm. unbelievable stuff. Just a fun guy to watch. I mean, when I was throwing bullpens like to him in spring training, it's like I thought I threw hard until mm -hmm. I stood next to him on a mound. I'm like, oh, that's a different level. He, this is a thousand horsepower <laughs> guy right next to me, just absolutely letting it eat. So those are guys I always kind of love watching because, like, man, that's stuff I cannot do, and it's just fun to watch people do stuff mm -hmm. you can't do. Um, I mean, there's so many guys, I mean, guys, are there guys you model yourself after, I mean, you mentioned trouble Hoffman, but are there guys where you see elements of you in the game? You mentioned Romano a little bit, obviously. Yeah. Romano, I think is, is pretty similar with the fastball slider approach yeah. um, with the, with the blue Jays. I was kind of definitely more of a fastball slider guy mm -hmm. as well. Um, I like guys like Tyler Kinley as well. Uh, Justin Verlander. Cause they, they have pitches that they have maybe one pitch that I have that I can see how they use it and mm -hmm. how I can implement it in my game, how they set it up. When do they throw it? What counts to what hitters? And and it's just always the cat and mouse with the hitters. Yeah. So it's always cool to see. Um, some guy who I have really not a lot in common with at all, uh, Kyle Hendricks. 
Yeah. He's a guy I <laughs> love to watch. Not mm-hmm. only on the mound, but I watch him when he's uh, not on the mound in the clubhouse. He is just right in his in his iPad looking at hitters, yeah. like just breaking them down every day. Like that's the stuff that makes him so great. And I was able to kind of just learn from him. And he's such a cool guy. You can yeah. he's so locked in the zone and you can walk by him and say, hey, Kyle, like, are you, are you looking at the line? He's like, yeah, you want to come and, and look at these guys? I'm like, heck yeah, I do. I mean, yeah. you're 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 the professor i'm here to take notes. <laughs> uh so he's it, it's cool to see all those all those guys do different things and you really can learn from i think anyone yeah. you know take a lot from anyone yeah kyle hendrick great previous podcast guest for those who haven't checked it out already one of my one of my favorite episodes um what about favorite teammate of all time it can be for any reason you don't have to pick just one oh, either um probably a lesser known name mm-hmm. uh this goes back to my rehab days with the jays uh devin travis yeah, yeah. Uh, baseman uh um, county guy yeah, no, he's, I mean, one of the best human beings on and off, like not even in baseball, just some of the best like character I've ever seen in people. And like I said, the mental grind of rehab, the way he can be so positive and uplift, not just him, but everyone around him in that setting is like so crazy looking back on it. Like when you're in rehab, you're so focused on your stuff. How am I ever going to get back? Am I going to play again? there's all these thoughts and like having a guy like that who can just like just give you a break and just lift everyone up and you can have a good time. Even in that setting, I was like, it, it, it blew me away. Um, he's probably my number one. I mean, there's guys that I play with now. I, I love being with the Cubs, you know, Dansby Swanson, one of the most great stand-up guys you can, you can have in a clubhouse, James Tyone. These guys are just absolute pleasure to have around, you know, they're guys you want to hang out with like outside of baseball, which I think is, is a huge sign of a great, great teammate for sure. I love that. All right. So big time high school, then you went to a junior college, you went to NAI, and then you played for three separate organizations as you've gone through baseball. So you've been around a lot of different coaches at a lot of different levels. I'm curious when you look back, uh, what were some of the qualities of the best coaches that you've had along the way? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's baseball. You, you can get into the X's and O's. You can get into the, oh, what what am I doing here? And and we have so much tech now. I think that helps coaches identify certain things. Uh, whether, oh, uh, your stride length is here and there. And, that, and that's that's great. I think every guy should know themselves really well and, and use those tools. But I found that the coaches that I, you know, really learned from the most were the coaches that were trying to build a relationship with you yeah. and, and really get to know you as a person. Because then you, you felt like they were really um, – they're really invested in your career. And that that goes such a long way for minor league players and, and guys who are coming through the system when they're just kind of, they're not really sure of who they are yet. And if you have a guy who kind of believes in you and, and really is getting to know you, you're like, oh, wow, this guy believes in what I do. And like, it just gives you that that confidence, I, I guess, to kind of truly fulfill that potential, I think. And and that that's probably something that I've seen in, in all my favorite coaches. Like they they're they're there to build the relationship as a person first. And then, you know, it, it help, that itself, I think, helps you go out there and perform for sure. And it becomes a collaboration, right? It's not just him oh, telling you what to do. It's you exactly. giving him feedback that that builds on previous interactions. I love that. What about uh, going back in time? Give teenage Julian Merriweather some advice. Oh, man, eat eat something. <laughs> a little twig, man. I, I mean, I just, I, I was always a guy who liked being in the gym. I think n- nutrition was something that I just kind of wasn't as focused on. Um, so I'll just say, Hey man, put, put the fork to mouth a little bit and, and then fill out. But I mean, as far as baseball advice, it, it would be kind of just, Hey, you got to keep trying, keep trying stuff. Uh, the way I got to where I am is I just, I would fail and I would try something new, fail, try something new. And, and it's really discouraging. It's super, super discouraging. You get in some pretty low spots and I would just, I mean, I went through that and I got through it, but I would just tell myself, Hey man, you're, the lows are, are going to be worth the highs for sure. I love that. And I love the the nutrition advice because it is Thanksgiving week. We should oh, remind, yeah. remind all our listeners that leftovers are for quitters. Exactly. Um, and on that note, man, thank you so much for taking the time. This is really good. Got to turn over some rocks that I didn't know about you and learn a little bit more after, uh, after seeing you for a few years here. I appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on. Good stuff, man. We'll be cheering for you this off season and beyond. So thanks for taking the time. Of course, man. 
Thanks so much for tuning in to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. We really appreciate you carving out some time in your schedule to listen, not just to this episode, but also to some of the episodes from our archives. If you enjoy what you heard, we'd love it if you'd share it with friends, colleagues, and teammates, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thanks again for your time.